Okay, let's dive into this. We did a version of this several years ago. This is an updated version. And frankly, um, I think these topics, uh, if you're not thinking about them periodically, you should be. So hopefully this will uh, uh, you know, serve that purpose and, um, and it'll be a little bit interactive and if nothing else, a refresher. And many of the questions, one of the more, uh, um, one of the important things about this, I think is it stresses that many of these issues actually are not intuitive. Many of the ethical rules and the privilege rules are not intuitive. And I think through some of the polling questions, we'll see that a little bit as well. Or it's a very technical area in many respects. Okay, so let's start, jump right into it, starting with scenario number one, the scope of privilege. Uh, and this is, this is the fact pattern through which we'll look at everything. Um, you're the AGC of Riverside, resident in Plano, several plants and other facilities in other states, including a manufacturing plant in Nate, Oklahoma. Your job responsibilities require periodic visits to the plant and the offices. During one of those visits to the offices, you meet with Alexandra Ashby, AVP of Riverside in charge of procurement. Ms. Ashby has day-to-day -day responsibility for purchasing, although her boss, the plant manager, who's a VP, makes the ultimate decisions on such matters. She tells you of an ongoing dispute with Supplier Corp, a company based in Oklahoma, and asks your advice. After listening to her description of the problem, you provide her with answers, which you later document with a memo to your files. Scenario number one continued, and here's the question. You see what we got? All right. Well, this one is probably easy for you and all too familiar. It's clear the attorney-client privilege and other doctrines such as work product protection extend to in-house counsel just as to outside counsel. Unfortunately, it's also true that most courts apply a higher level of scrutiny to communications with corporate counsel than to communications with outside counsel, primarily because of the perception that in-house counsel routinely provide both legal and business advice. So the best answer is, is B, is the second answer that a heightened level of scrutiny would owe to your status. Not like I could say your first, the, those in the first category, it's wrong, but the best answer is B. Um, all right, uh, scenario number two, um, scope of privilege. All right, great. The ongoing dispute was not resolved short of litigation. Supplier court files suit uh, against Riverside in Texas responding to a document request. Riverside's trial counsel withholds your memorandum uh, on a privilege log. Supplier moves to compel production of the memo and to require you to appear for deposition to testify as to the conversation. Let's look at our next question. And the question is what test will determine whether your conversation with Ms. Ashby can be considered subject to the attorney-client privilege. If we can put that question up. All right, and then, great. Your choice is either the subject matter test, the control group test, or it depends. Let's see what we got. Fascinating. All right. Well, the correct answer is C. The wording, and it, it really depends on which, which jurisdiction's privilege law is applied. And this is a good example of um, what we're gonna talk about. So there you go, there's my, that's a, how's that for a transition? Let's go to the next, let's go to the next slide. So the control group test is the older of the tests. And the thing about the control group test is that communications with an employee of a corporation or other entity are only privileged if the employee was a decision maker or otherwise in a position to substantially participate in a decision that the company would take uh, based on the attorney's advice. It's a more, it's a heightened test. Most courts realize that that test is unduly restrictive. Attorneys need to communicate with people who aren't in control under that definition. They aren't quote unquote decision makers for the purpose of ascertaining facts needed in order to render legal advice. Hence, the subject matter test under Upjohn is the more prevalent test today. It's the test that governs under Texas law. And the test for inclusion of company employees is whether the employee had a quote unquote need to know. 
If the court were to apply Oklahoma law, the older control group test would determine whether your communication with Ms. Ashby is privileged. In our hypothetical, Ms. Ashby as an AVP arguably isn't a member of the control group. Remember we said the plant manager makes the ultimate decisions but your advice almost certainly is within the scope of her duties. So if the subject matter test were to apply, your communication with her is privileged. So the two, there are two approaches for determining which law governs evidentiary privileges. So the question is which, state will gov which state's law will govern. We'll move through these fairly quickly and you can keep your, and, and you'll have the materials. Most states in which the courts have decided the issue of conflict of laws for evidentiary privileges follow one of the two tests on the screen, territorial. The minority of the states use the territorial approach. Uh, they, apply the, um, they apply the law of the forum state to determine whether a communication is privileged. Most states have decided the issue, including Texas, uh, using the most significant relationships test which is based under section 130, uh, on section 139 of the restatement, um, second of conflicts of laws. To the next slide. Um, the applicable section, restatement section as, re, um, as revised, was revised in 1988, it's, it's dense. And if you're reading it for the first time, here's the summary. Once you determine which state has the most significant relationship with the communication, section one says, that if the communication isn't privileged under that state's law, it will be admitted into evidence, even if it would be privileged under the form state's law. In our hypothetical, we think Oklahoma has the most significant relationship. As we said, Oklahoma applies the control group test. Ms. Ashby probably isn't a member of the control group, not a decision maker. So your communication with her probably won't be found to be privileged by a Texas court even though it would be privileged under Texas law, unless you can convince the court that admitting it would contravene strong public policy of Texas. That would be an uphill battle. And if you look at section two, that's the same bias toward admissibility. Absent some special reason, the communication won't be privileged. Your memo and advice will be admitted. Even if it would be privileged in the state with the most significant relationship, it would be at admissible under the law of the form state here, Oklahoma. In other words, if the law of either the form state or the state with the most significant relationship would require admission, the communication likely would not be privileged. Let's go to the next slide. Um, in federal court, for cases in which jurisdiction is based on federal question, the subject test applies as a matter of federal common law. For diversity cases, federal courts act as a, like a state court sitting in that state. If there's federal question jurisdiction and pendant state law claims, most courts apply the subject test overall. And let's go to scenario number three. All right, here the suit against Riverside is primarily a contract claim. The contract between supplier corp and Riverside includes a choice of law clause reciting that this contract shall be governed by and subject to the laws of the state of Texas. Will the Texas court enforce the provision and apply Texas law to, to the question of whether your communication with Ms. Ashby is subject to attorney-client privilege? And this is a polling question. So let's put the question up. Let's see what we got. All right. Remember, I, I gave everyone some safety because I said these are counterintuitive. So that's a nice way of saying most of you got this one wrong. Um, the answer is B, uh, the issue of whether the parties can contractually dictate governing law for privilege questions, and if so, what language is required has not been addressed by many courts, but based on the current case law, the best answer is B, even assuming the parties can dictate privilege law in the contract, the general provision that we just looked at is likely not specific enough. The provision that we used was lifted from the case Hercules versus Martin Marietta, one of the few cases to consider the issue. It was a federal diversity case, meaning, meaning state law would govern. Neither party was a Utah resident, and most of the contract dispute involved activities in Utah. Martin Marietta moved to compel Hercules to produce documents. Under Col Colorado law, there is an accountant client privilege, so Hercules obviously wanted Colorado law to apply. 
so he could claim privilege. Utah law does not recognize that privilege. So Martin Marietta obviously argued that pri Utah privilege law should apply. And uh, you can see how the court ruled that the general choice of law provision without more specific language did not apply to privilege issues. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the takeaway here is that you want a specific, if, if you want a specific state's law to govern privilege issue, the best practice is to expand the language and the choice of law provision to specifically include privileged communications and documents. Uh, here, um, one, a one sentence addition would be, um, would, would suffice like we, like we show, showed here by way of example. You wanna have a reference to all matters of privileges to communication to documents shall be subject to and governed by the laws of the state of Texas. All right, let's, and then with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Janae Ward and uh, I'll, I'll speak at the end of the presentation. So thank you so much. Janae, take Thanks. it away. Thanks, Paul. Okay, we're gonna move on to a different scenario and a different topic. So here you still work at Riverside Assistant General Counsel and you're having a casual conversation with the CEO of the company. And she asks you for some very informal advice about her potential divorce, particularly about the division of property in a contested divorce. You answer the, the question as best as you can while of course disclaiming expertise on the subject. So a couple months go by and the divorce proceedings are underway and they are indeed contested. Um, there's a big fight about whether the very general and formal advice you gave to the CEO over coffee is privileged. And now I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that this has happened to nearly all of you before. We hear about it all the time. You have a friend or a family member, or in this case, a, a close contact a employee at the company that they see you as a trusted advisor and a friend. So they naturally ask you informal advice about um, their personal legal issues. Um, my friends and family ask me for informal legal advice all the time. I think they asked me about it before I even graduated law school. So let's get to the question at hand and you can pull up the poll, please. The question is whether your conversation with the CEO is privileged. And I'll give you a few moments to answer the question. So the best answer based upon the limited facts in which most people chose is B. But of course, either answer could be correct according to additional facts. It's important to remember that your day-to-day -day client is the company and the company speaks and acts through its officers and employees. But whether you can also have an attorney-client relationship with an officer in her individual capacity that would justify privilege depends on the company policy regarding non-company matters. Generally, if situations like this comes up, it's almost always a good idea, even if it might be uncomfortable, to give a reminder that you represent the company and you cannot guarantee that any conversation on a personal legal matter will be considered privileged. So here we have uh, another scenario and the next couple of scenarios will deal on conflicts issues, which I'm sure most of you've dealt with before. So here you've engaged a law firm, Shrake and Jenkins to represent Riverside in a transaction that closed eight months ago. The firm has not done any work for you since then, and the engagement letter that you had with the law firm stated that they would perform legal services as agreed upon from time to time. Now that law firm, Shrank and Jenkins, has hired a partner that represents Supplier Corp, a competitor in, the, in a brewing potential litigation dispute with your company, Riverside. Um, Shrank and Jenkins asked you to sign a conflicts waiver, but you don't want to sign a conflicts waiver. So Shrink and Jenkins responds by terminating the attorney-client relationship. And the question now is whether you can successfully move to disqualify that law firm from re representing supplier for your competitor in the litigation and whether that motion should be granted. So you can pull up the poll, please. All right, so this was a, it's a tough one. And I can see based upon the answers, it was a little tough as well. So the best answer based upon the facts is probably B. This scenario is based on a case out of the Eastern District of California, Regal Cinemas v. Shops at Summerlin. In Regal, the court found that the company was a former client because one, no work had been done since the conclusion of the transaction, and two, the transaction was not substantially related to the litigation, and finally three, due to that as agreed upon from time to time language in the engagement letter. So in this scenario, you invite several firms to give pitches to represent Riverside in a new patent infringement case. 
And during one of those pitches, Riverside's engineers attended the meeting and answered detailed questions from the attorneys about the product at issue. Your boss, the general counsel, ultimately decided to retain a different firm. And one of the firms that made a pitch and heard the detailed answers from the engineers now represents the other side in the litigation. So Riverside's counsel moves to disqualify the other firm, Mason Darrow. Should the court grant the motion and disqualify the whole law firm? You can please, uh, please pull up the poll question. So this, of course, all, as Paul said, these are tough questions and they get, are kind of counterintuitive. And as we'll discuss on the next few slides, the best answer here is B. The court should grant the motion and disqualify Mason and Darrow because they obtained confidential information that might be disadvantageous to Riverside. And we'll talk more about it, like I said, in the next few slides. So looking at Texas law specifically, the Texas rules of disciplinary uh, conduct concerning attorney's confidentiality obligations refers to clients and former clients, which is not very helpful in this scenario because we're talking about a potential client. But there is some information in the disciplinary rules that may be helpful. The preamble regarding the scope of the attorney-client relationship suggests that the duty of confidentiality may attach before there's even an attorney-client relationship, relationship. So this suggests that in Texas, the whole firm may be disqualified if they obtained confidential information during the, the pitch. And looking outside of the Texas model uh, rules, we can look at the ABA's model rules, which to date have been adopted in other jurisdictions, including New York. And the ABA model rules provide an exception allowing the lawyers in the firm to represent a client with adverse interests if there is appropriate screening of the lawyer who participated in the pitch and that lawyer doesn't share in the fee. Texas, however, has not adopted this model rule allowing for the screening process exception. We also found a Texas case, Henry Gary, out of the appellate court in Tyler, holding that the term client includes one who consults with an attorney with a view to obtaining legal services, even if the lawyer was not ultimately engaged. So the takeaway here is that this qualification really depends on whether or not the discussions during the pitch involved specific and confidential company information, or instead were high level discussions on the area of law and publicly available information, such as a complaint that's already been filed. There is one important point for a corporate counsel to keep in mind though, is that in Texas, it's likely not permissible to invite multiple firms to give pitches with the goal of later disqualifying that firm from representing an opposing party. And this comes from Texas Professional Ethics Committee Opinion 676, which found that a lawyer could not retain or disclose information to a prospective uh, expert witness when the lawyer had no substantial purpose other than to simply disqualify that expert from being used by the opposing party. Okay, so let's recall that your company, Riverside, has been sued for patent infringement by Troll LLC. And you've heard pitches from both Mason and Darrow and Nerd Dork LP. You ultimately choose to retain Nerd Dork, uh, a firm that have professed expertise in such matters. And uh, Nerd Dork recommends that the company bring an inter partes review, which is a trial proceeding before the USPTO trial and appeal board to review the patentability of a claim or claims in a patent. Uh, Nerd Dork LP said it, it knew how to manage such proceedings and bring them to a prompt resolution. Nerd Dork offered to handle the case for a flat fee and your general counsel agreed. Well, a year later and things aren't going as planned, Troll LLC has vigorously defended the, the validity of this patent and discovery has been more extensive. Um, and the final hearing is still months away and there's just a lot of work going on in this case that Nerdwork did not anticipate. Nerdwork LP is now demanding that Riverside modify its fee arrangement. What do you do? Do you acquiesce to Nerdwork's demands and recommend that Riverside agree to the modification and payment of additional fees? Well, I'll give you a few moments to answer the poll question. And based on the answers, and most people got it right, uh, and based on the limit, limited information we gave you, the answer is probably B. So this issue was actually considered by the Professional Ethics Committee, which rendered an opinion, which is summarized in this slide. 
And there's also an unreported case on this subject, Jan Paul v. Matthews, which was decided in 1997 by the Houston First District Court of Appeals, which basically came to the same conclusion as the Texas Professional Ethics Committee, that a client may modify the fee arrangement during the existence of an attorney-client relationship, but there's presumption of unfairness because the client is at a disadvantage and might hesitate to resist the change because of fear of resentment by the lawyer. The Professional Ethics Committee mentioned several factors to be considered in deciding whether a modification is appropriate, including whether the attorney-client relationship is longstanding, in which case a renegotiation may be more appropriate. And we can go to the next slide and I'll hand it off to my associate, Megan. Thanks, Janae. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about conflict waivers. In the situation on the screen, we have Riverside, who retained Big Law LP to advise it on employment benefit plans, the company's 401k plan, and other employment and benefit issues. You work for Riverside, and your boss signed the engagement letter that contained the advanced conflict waiver that's on the screen, and I'll give you a second to look it over. So two years after Riverside engaged Big Law, Creek Bank, a longtime client of Big Law, filed a trade secrets lawsuit against Riverside in a Dallas federal court. An IP boutique filed the initial complaint, but later amended the in, the in an amended complaint named Big Law as additional counsel for Creek Bank. Riverside moved to disqualify Big Law as Creek Bank's counsel in that case. Will it prevail? Tell us what you think in the poll. Okay, so for the reasons we will discuss, the answer is likely B, Big Law won't be disqualified. In the Fifth Circuit, the model rules of professional conduct apply to motions to disqualify. Under the model rules, the kind of concurrent conflict of interest mentioned in the scenario on the previous slide is generally not permitted unless the client has waived conflicting representation. The crucial question with respect to an advanced waiver is whether the client has provided informed consent. The nature of informed consent means that a more specific waiver is relatively more likely to be effective to waive conflicts in advance, while a general open-ended one is relatively less likely to be effective. So what constitutes informed consent? Model Rule 1.0 provides three factors that speak to whether disclosure was reasonably adequate to find informed consent. Those factors are agreement to a proposed course of conduct, after the lawyer has communicated adequate information and explanation about the material risks, and that the lawyer has proposed reasonably available alternatives to the proposed course of conduct. A disclosure must also be understood by the client to form informed consent. Whether a disclosure is reasonably adequate to allow the client to understand the risks of an advance waiver depend on the sophistication of the parties and whether the client was represented by independent counsel. In Galderma, a case out of the Northern District of Texas, or it provides us a useful example. In that case, Galderma was a corporate client represented by in-house counsel who signed an engagement letter with outside counsel purporting to waive conflicts in advance. When outside counsel began representing an adverse party and other unrelated litigation, Galderma moved to disqualify their outside counsel in that case. But the court declined to disqualify, finding that Galderma provided informed consent to waiver of future conflicts. Specifically, the waiver language in the engagement letter, which was very similar to the language in Big Law's engagement letter here, fully identified a course of conduct by which the parties could manage future conflict related to their attorney-client relationship. It fully explained the material risk of waiving future conflicts, and it provided reasonable alternatives to the proposed course of conduct. The court also noted that Galderma was a, a sophisticated company operating worldwide and with experience engaging large national firms. And in signing the engagement letter, Galderma was represented by its own general counsel who had over 20 years of experience practicing law and was a member of state and federal bars. Because the disclosure met the requirements of the model rules, the court found that disqualification of outside counsel wasn't warranted. Okay, so now let's assume all the same facts as the scenario we were discussing before, 
But now when Riverside engaged Big Law, Big Law's Boise office was serving as local counsel for plaintiff in a suit against Riverside in Idaho. Do these facts change the waiver analysis? Let's put up a poll and see what you think. So here with these new facts, the answer is likely A. As the court highlighted in Galderma, other circuits have adopted different standards for informed consent. The Galderma court considered, also considered Visa versus First Data Corp out of the Northern District of California and Selgene Corp versus KB Pharmaceutical out of the District of New Jersey. However, keep in mind that the Fifth Circuit has adopted a broader interpretation of informed consent than some other courts, including the District of New Jersey. We'll look briefly at both cases. In Visa, the court considered the California Rules of Professional Conduct, which are analogous to the model rules, because both require informed consent. In that case, Visa sued for data for trademark infringement, dilution, and breach of contract. But before it sued, Visa's counsel, Heller, was retained as counsel for first data in an unrelated patent infringement suit. As part of that engagement, Heller obtained a waiver that specifically permitted it to represent Visa in future litigation between it and first data because it wanted to preserve the ability to represent Visa, its longstanding client. When Visa eventually sued first data for millions of dollars, making disparaging arguments targeted at the core of first data's business, first data sought disqualification. But because the pre-existing relationship and risk of adversity had been disclosed, the court, in considering whether there had been informed consent, found that the advance waiver was adequate. In our scenario, there's a current adversity of interest, but Big Law failed to identify the current adversity with respect to the Boise litigation and its conflict waiver. In Celgene, the law firm Buchanan represented Celgene in a range of patent securities, transactional and litigation matters, including securities litigation. At the beginning of the securities litigation, Celgene signed a general open-ended advanced conflict waiver that permitted conflicts so long as the subject matter was, among other things, not substantially related to the subject matter of the securities litigation. Later, another lawyer joined the Buchanan firm, bringing another Celgene matter with him. He too had a conflict waiver that permitted conflicts, except in the case of substantially related subject matter. And later still, Celgene and others sued KB Pharmaceutical in a patent dispute. Buchanan entered an appearance for KB and Celgene sought to disqualify. In Celgene, the court found that Buchanan did not meet its burden to show informed consent because conflict waivers require full disclosure and consultation, which the Third Circuit interprets to require specificity as to the potential areas for conflict may foreseeably arise. Under this standard as well, the language in Big Law's conflict waiver would fail because it does not adequately inform Riverside of the specific conflict resulting from the Boise litigation. So we're now going to shift gears and move into the lightning round. So in this round, we are going to look at um, scenarios that might implicate privilege. Uh, these scenarios were all taken from a discovery ruling where a district court judge provided guidance to parties by setting out a series of hypothetical emails and what his ruling would be on each one. For all of these, imagine this dispute is between Texas corporations and all of the participants have jobs that are central to the contract and the dispute. Take a look at the first email from the Riverside CEO to your boss, the general counsel, asking if a term sheet with the CEO of Texaco will be binding. So you can put the poll up, please. Here the answer is A, the, the CEO is seeking legal advice from the attorney, so the email would be privileged. The next email is the response from the general counsel listing terms that are considered essential for a term sheet to a binding contract with Texco. Is this privileged? Great, again, most of you got this one right. Yes, it's privileged too, because the GC is providing legal advice. All right, so now the CEO is sending a message to the vice president who engaged in negotiations with Texaco saying RGC has advised that if we sign a term sheet with the following elements, it will be, it will be considered binding on Texaco even if we don't sign a longer form contract. Is this email privilege? Okay. So yes, it's privileged insofar as the email relays legal advice from the general counsel. 
But if the email were to go on to talk about other topics, the email ha may have to be produced with the legal advice redacted. All right, so now the vice president emails the sales manager that our CEO has instructed us to proceed to negotiate a contract for our services with Texco. Please get on this ASAP. Is this privileged? Oh, this is great. No, no privilege because there is no legal advice being sought, provided, or relayed in this situation. So next we have an email from the sales manager to the vice president saying, I've just met with my counterpart at Texco and we have a handshake deal. Can we skip the term sheet and move on to signing a full-fledged contract? Is this one privileged? Again, here the answer is also no. There's no legal advice being sought, provided, or relayed, even if the email discusses an arguably legal issue. If this email were to the general counsel, that answer might be different. Next, we have an email from the vice president to the CEO saying, let's keep the contract simple and direct and close the deal ASAP. Is this email privileged? Again, y'all are great. Again, no legal advice is being provided, or sought provided or relayed, even if the email involves the terms of a legal document. All right, in this instance, we have the CEO emailing the general counsel to draft this contract as quickly as possible and stating that it needs to include the following terms. Is this one going to be privileged? Okay, this one was trickier. This one is privileged because the CEO is providing information to the general counsel that is necessary for the legal department's provision of legal services. Now you send an email to an in-house paralegal at the GC's instruction saying the CEO wants a contract with Texco with the following provisions and to please take language from another contract to create a first draft. Is this privileged? Great, yes, A, it is privileged because you, an attorney, are providing information to a paralegal for the purpose of drafting a contract. The VP then emails the paralegal saying, I hear you're working on the contract with Texco. Please write these exact words into paragraph six. The per unit price is $400. Is this privileged? Oh, an even split. Here, no, it's not privileged. The paralegal is acting as a scrivener uh, for language that's dictated to him. So next, the GC emails the vice president forwarding the draft contract and saying, here's my proposed contract, show this to Texco, but tell them it's non-negotiable. Is this privileged? Okay. So here the answer is C. The emailed instructions are privileged, but the attachment is not, so long as it isn't changed as a result of the communication with the vice president. So in an email from the vice president to his counterpart at Texaco says, here is our proposed contract. Our general counsel says, since we are giving you such a good deal, we must insist on the terms as written. Please sign it and return it to me. Is this email going to be privileged? So most of you got this right. Here, the answer is B, it's not privileged. The legal advice from Texaco's general counsel lost its privilege when it was sent to the other side. Now, consider some ex email exchanges between non-lawyers at Riverside after the contract's been executed, arguing over its interpretation and at times indicating their reliance on your advice. Are these emails privileged? Okay, so here the answer is C. The portions of the emails that relay or summarize your legal advice can be redacted. When a dispute arises later about the interpretation of the contract, the vice president, after speaking with the CEO, emails you to ask you your interpretation and you respond. Is the email you sent privileged? All right, so here, the answer is A, these communications are privileged as to the vice president's communications with you.
All right, finally, the VP sends the email chain, including your response to her counterpart at Texco. Is your advice still privileged? Okay, so unfortunately, no, it is no longer privileged. Any privilege um, the emails had was lost when they were forwarded to the other side. All right, so that's it for the lightning round. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Janae to talk about attorney immunity. So one last uh, scenario before we end our presentation. So in this scenario, Riverside was formally involved in a joint venture with Riverfront, um, a joint venture called Riverfront JV with another company, uh, Lakefront Corp. The two companies decided to dissolve the joint venture and the dissolution was handled by in-house lawyers with you representing Riverside and a counterpart in Lakefront's legal department representing the company. And so time goes past and a year later, um, Lakefront has sued Riverside in state court alleging multiple claims, including fraud and seeking a reformation of the documentation for the dissolution of the joint venture. Um, the lawsuit hasn't been threatened. It wasn't, un it wasn't unexpected. However, what was unexpected is that you, as an assistant GC um, is, or is, is listed as a co-defendant with Riverside, alleging that you were a joint tort feasor in drafting documents that didn't accurately reflect the actual agreement for dissolution between the two former joint venturers. And so the question here is, should you be concerned about a potential judgment against you personally? And please pull up the poll and I'll give you some time to answer the question. So this is a tough one, but happily and thankfully, the correct answer is C. No, as an attorney, you have immunity for claims of this nature by non-clients. The doctrine under the doctrine of attorney immunity, which I don't think is very well known, even though it should be. In um, Yonkin case, the Yonkin v. Hines case, which you can see on your screen, the Court of Appeals held that the attorney failed to prove attorney immunity. However, the Supreme Court reversed holding that the conduct that the plaintiff complained of in the complaint, negotiating and entering into a settlement agreement, preparing transfer documents and filing a lawsuit falls squarely within the scope of Yonkin's representation of his clients and is not foreign to the duties of a lawyer. The Houston Court of Appeals also noted that one type of conduct that is not within the scope of attorney representation and is foreign to the duties of a lawyer would be assaulting counsel during trial. And this was in the case Brat v. West. So thankfully, if you're acting within the scope of your representation of your client, you are immune for direct suits. And so now I'll hand it back to Paul to close us out. So y'all see how that works. Um, uh, Janae ends with letting you know that like assaulting your opposing counsel in trial isn't immune. And then she passes it to me. What am I supposed to do with that? No. So, um, Hopefully you all, um, this was helpful and, and refresher or some new information. Uh, I also think you probably, um, you know, get a feel for uh, what a treat I what a treat it is for me to get to work with both Janae and Megan on a daily basis. Um, couple takeaways um, aside from the fact that um, I will be laughing to myself the rest of the day. How many times Janae had to say nerd dork um, and with a straight face. Um, now she doesn't. She can she can smile when she says it. Um, I do think it's important, though, look, looking through these, uh, you actually have the ability to uh, determine whether something's privileged or not, oftentimes by by uh, what you write, how you write it and whether you send it in writing. And I think that's just a, a good reminder for all of us. And if you have a question as to whether something is going to be privileged before you send it, you should ask someone. Um, because if you, if, it, if, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to make something that otherwise might not be privileged, 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 or increase the chances that it will be held to be privileged. And I just think that's an important thing, given whether you're in a litigation context, a transaction context, or in a context where you, where, where you may not be anticipating that there's going to be a dispute and that someone might want to get your emails. Uh, I think those things are all um, important. Uh, with that, I think we're close to um, the hour, uh, within within a rounding error of the hour. Um, uh, it, it's fantastic. Susan, thank you for having us. Hopefully this is
hopefully this was useful and entertaining uh, and valuable beyond the ethics credit. So thanks so much and hope everyone stays safe and, and has a happy Halloween.